Well, hello gang, Mario from The Woodfather here and welcome to my workshop. Or really, welcome to my happy place. This is my happy place, I love it in here. And the actual part of it that I'm in right now, I'm here sitting on my workbench, I've got my hanging tool cabinet behind me. This is my favorite part of my happy place. I really like this spot. The reason I like it is because I think eight years ago now, I built the workbench that was a really, really fun build and I've gotten heaps of use out of it. Every single project I do touches the workbench in some manner. Um, and just over two years ago now, I built this hanging tool cabinet. I actually built it as part of the spring storage challenge. I think that's the hashtag, I've probably got it wrong. It's actually my own hashtag because that was a uh, one of the challenges that I ran a couple of years ago. The reason I did the oh, spring storage challenge, that's what it was. And the whole point of that challenge was that other woodworkers or other makers would go and build or make something that they could use in their workshop for storage. And the reason I set that challenge is because I wanted to build this cabinet for years and years and years, and I never actually got around to it. So by setting the challenge, it sort of forced me to go out of my way to go and finish the build. Otherwise it would have looked pretty bad if I didn't have an entry in my own challenge. So. <laughs> if there's something you want to build, just set a challenge for it, make everyone else build something, and then it'll sort of guilt you into building your own. And the thing is, it's, it's, it's over two years since I built it, and I was in here the other day doing something, and I looked over and I thought, gee, the cabinet looks really nice. It's got a lot of tools in there now. When I built it, I think I only sort of filled out, I might have had one or two planes, and I might have put a couple of chisels up here, not a whole lot. Um, but over the years, I've been adding more and more things. And every now and again, I do go and rearrange stuff. Um, and I'm thinking that probably soon I'm going to go rearrange everything again. But before I do that, I thought I might just spend a few minutes just looking at my tools and <laughs> talking about them. <laughs> so I'm not building anything this video. Feel free to, to move on. I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the tools that are in my tool cabinet that I really like. Because this is my happy place and it makes me happy. It's about that simple, really. It probably makes sense to start with the cabinet itself, hey? So the cabinet is made out of a frame of spotted gum. I actually got it for free because I went and bought some nice timber off of a, uh, a woodworker who was moving house and had to clear out his workshop. Um, and he had all this spotted gum lying around, which I really had to go and pick my way through because a lot of it was ruined and had a lot of sapwood and a lot of knots and things like that. But I got all the nice pieces out of it, cleaned it all up, and then I had pretty much exactly enough to make the frame. So. That's a long way of saying that this box is made out of spotted gum. The two sides are made out of spotted gum. There's a plywood back here. I've got some drawers in here which are made from oak and I think it's oak again on the sides. Yes. Um, and on the front, we've got a couple of different types of plywood, I think. Oh, it's oak. That's right. It's American oak plywood. And that's what it looks like when it's all closed up. Unfortunately, because it's in here, it does get kind of dusty. And when I go and spray other things around here, that sort of sticks on here. So every now and again, I have to go and give it a bit of a scrub to make it look clean. But it probably spends 95% of the time with the doors open instead of closed. So I almost never get to see it like this. I quite like it though, it looks pretty cool. The doors are held shut with, I've got a couple of screws here, and then there's magnets on the wings. Two nice big piano hinges, and that's it. I think we'll start over here on the right hand side. No, on the left hand side. My right, your left. I don't know. Anyway, this saw here has been used precisely twice. It is <laughs> terrible, is what it comes down to. Um, I bought it years ago when I was doing, um, what was I doing? I was doing the daily dovetail. That's when every day for about four months in a row, I woke up, I came out here at about six in the morning and I cut myself a dovetail so that I would get better at cutting dovetails. And this was a saw that was recommended by a lot of people saying that it's, um, it, it was just a really good dovetail saw. You can resharpen it. Everything's really cool like that. It has got the worst handle in the history of handles. Um, it's just so painful. You can't hold it for, for any time at all. It just feels like you're holding a block of Lego. I really couldn't stand it. The reason it's in the work, in the tool cabinet is because, why is it in the tool cabinet? So the reason it's still in the tool cabinet and it hasn't been cast aside somewhere else is because number one, it cost me a hundred bucks. So <laughs> I can't just throw a hundred dollars away, even though I'm not using it. But number two, I think Rex Kruger also happened to buy the same saw um, probably six months later or something. 
he went and used it and he said, oh, look, the saw's really good. The blade's quite good, but the handle's just horrible. And he's gone through, designed a new handle, and he actually even shared plans for it so that you could, if you bought this saw, you can go and make a much nicer handle and replace it without having to do any measuring or anything like that. So my intention was always to go and uh, grab his plans, change the handle on this so that it suits me nicer, and then start using it. I haven't done that, but it's in the tool cabinet, so I really should do it. In fact, I will. I'll do that very soon. So next to the saw that I never use are three saws that I use all the time. I really enjoy using uh, this one here. This is a very thin kerf Dazuki blade. It's, that's crazy thin. It, it's like 0.2 of a mil or something like that. It, it's, well, maybe not 0.2 mil, maybe 0.2 mil, why not? It's awesome, it's super thin. I was using this for my daily dovetails again. Um, however, because the teeth are so fine, the woods that I was cutting into, it was just binding too much. So it's, it's really good. I absolutely love it. It's one of the favorite saws that I have, but I did end up replacing it uh, for dovetails at least with this one, which is the same thing, just a whole lot bigger. Um, the teeth are a lot bigger, it's got more of a set on it, um, and it's it's so much fun to use. These, it's so much more fun than a Western saw. Oh, if you're cutting anything, you wanna get one of these. Oh, it's got dust on it, how, how terrible of me. I do have, I think it's called a Ryoba. This one, it's a little bit embarrassing, but you can see the teeth are just absolutely chewed up. I've completely destroyed them. That's on the crosscut side. If I remember correctly, I think what happened is I was cutting through wood, which had a little bit of super glue. I think I had glued together a crack or something like that. And I thought, oh, that'll be fine. So I went to cut through it. Apparently super glue is crazy strong and the teeth of this saw just were not really up to the task. So basically it, uh, it broke a couple of teeth and it bent a couple of other ones. And then as I persisted, because I'm not the smartest guy in the world, I just proceeded to go and chew up the rest of the teeth. So that was a little bit silly. I haven't replaced it because the ripping side is still perfectly fine and I still use it for rip cuts. There's no dramas there. And I actually use one of these two saws whenever I'm doing cross cuts anyway. So I haven't actually gone back to one of these. As soon as I get a little bit more on wear on this side, I'll just go buy another blade and replace it. Or maybe I can't replace the blade on this one. Maybe I'll just have to go buy a new one. Again, really cool saw. I'm a big fan of the Japanese saws. I like them a lot. The last uh, commonly used saw that I have is this one here. Again, it's another Japanese saw. It's a very thin, very flexible flush trim saw. This is the very first this is the very first nice tool that I think I bought for myself. And when I say nice tool, it's probably eight or nine years ago. I went to Timbercon back when they were at their old store. Not the old store in Epping, but they used to have a store in Coburg, um, which is, I'm going to say it's at least eight or nine years ago. And I had to save up. It was only like $45, but at the time I was just starting out in woodworking. I really had no money um, and I just sort of saved up effectively. And I saw this and I thought, I love it. I want to use it because I saw other YouTubers use it. And I brought it home and it is every bit as good as I thought it would be. It's fantastic. Absolutely love it. Had it 10 years, use it all the time. It's a great saw. That's all I can say about it. Actually, no, I will say something else. Whenever I see people using this, they seem to be using it like a saw. So imagine you've got a dowel and you're trying to trim that dowel to, to bring it down flush with everything else. Don't saw back and forth. That's not how you use it. Put it down and then just pull it to you nice and slow, then go back to the front and then pull it to you again. Every time you go forward, that's when you're gonna start chewing up and scratching up the piece of wood that you're cutting. So yeah, just go slow, pull it towards you and just enjoy it because it's so much fun to use. Really, really cool saw. Now there is one more thing in this wing. It's not a tool, but it's a reminder. This is a, a warning to me to not be a friggin' moron in the workshop. If you don't know what this is, this is one of those straps that you can buy. You can buy them all over the place. I got this at Bunnings. Um, it's got lots of little tabs on it with little holes and you can use it for securing stuff. You know, whatever you wanna do, you can break it off, make it shorter if you need to, whatever it may be. You can see the holes on it. They're, I don't know, five mil across. I needed a hole to be a little bit wider for whatever I was using it for. So I decided to drill it out. You can see what I tried to do there. This is the metal strap that broke my thumb about five or six years ago. 
This thing caused me so much physical pain, <laughs> but I've got no one but myself to blame. So long story short, I was drilling into it. I don't think I was even using the drill press. I think I was using a drill. I had this long strap on a piece of wood and because I'm a big strong man, I was holding it down. So holding the strap down with one hand, drilling into it with the other, it immediately caught on the drill bit naturally, ripped it right out of my hand. It gave me a nice big slash right through here and then started spinning around like a helicopter. Luckily, my hand was in the way. So instead of this hitting anything, you know, of value in the workshop, it decided to just bash into my thumb and then it bashed into my thumb again. And then it bashed into my thumb again. I, I don't know how many times, but each time friggin' hurt. <laughs> um, yeah, it sliced right through my thumb, cut up a lot of my fingers, but my thumb really copped it. It felt like a hammer had just bashed my thumb over and over and over. It's like that scene in uh, Casino where Joe Pesci uh, <laughs> beats the crap out of the guy's hand with a hammer. That's what it felt like happened to my thumb because effectively that is what happened to my thumb. I remember, I remember I was in the workshop and once I calmed down, it, it would have been 15, 20 seconds, I was standing there um, just sort of holding my hands and there was blood all over the place. It wasn't squirting out, but it was everywhere. And I was standing here and I was holding my thumb back because I was too scared to move it. And it looked like I'd cut my thumb off. I thought I was ready to go to the emergency room. And I was standing there shaking, going, oh my God, I've cut off my thumb, I've cut off my thumb, I've cut off my thumb. And then I was just was breathing and I still remember it all because it was such a happy moment when I realized that I hadn't actually cut off my thumb. I thought it was almost falling off because it was bending that far back. And I actually took my other hand off and then went, ah, oh. and it was the same angle. So that's when I knew, oh, beautiful. I haven't actually cut off my thumb. However, I did really freaking hurt it. it. It broke, I'm gonna say both bones. I didn't go to the doctor to get it checked out because what can you do for a broken thumb anyway? So bandaged it up. Uh, it hurt for about three months, um, but eventually it did recover fully. So everything's okay in the end. So that's why this little guy stays here as a constant reminder for me. If I'm a little bit tired, if I'm skipping a step, I just glance over here and I think, yep, yeah, no, nah, it's not worth it. I'm gonna stop, I'll figure out and I'll make sure I do it the right way. So good for me to have, but it's kind of sad about why it's here in the first place. The worst thing about that is back at the time I used to ride my bike to work to the city every day, so a 40, 50 minute ride every day. And that was the thumb that I used to ring my little bell to get people out of my way. So <laughs> that was quite annoying. I also couldn't change gears on the bike. That's no, stupid. I need to talk less, so this is gonna be a very long video. This side of the tool cabinet obviously is for my chisels, knife and rasps. It also has this little ruler gauge. I made this um, a few years ago. I think it's made out of Brazilian walnut and aluminium, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's right. I've epoxied aluminium through there. Um, it's really, really quite a handy tool. I built it as part of my uh, summer of tools, maybe, or tool. I don't know. I had some hashtag. There's a bunch of videos where for a few months I made hand tools. The point of that was to just get a little bit better at making things and at making smaller things and hopefully getting a little bit more accurate as I was making things. So ruler gauge is really cool. You want to leave a mark that's exactly eight mil, you just slide it down, you tighten that up, and then you've got all this to uh, uh, to use as a fence and you can make your marks. Comes in handy all the time. Really a big fan of it. I actually, I've been meaning for a little while to make another one for a thinner ruler as well. One of the things that's improved my woodworking, or sorry, my furniture making, I guess, over the last few years, is realizing that woodworkers use rasps and files. I never used to use them, and that's why everything I had was cold and stark and pointy, whereas now everything is feathered and softened, and it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to use a file at the same time. These files aren't anything crazy. I think they were about 50 bucks from Bunnings for a pack of five of them. Um, some flat ones, round ones, and then whatever the half cove is called. I don't know. One of them is the bastard file. I like that, bastard file. Um, this one though, Shinto saw rasp, I think that's what it's called. You know how every now and again you see a, a model of car, like you'll see a, a Lexus. And then for the next five weeks, everywhere you go, every time you go out, you just notice Lexus, 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 Lexus. About five or six years ago, I saw one woodworker use a saw rasp. I think it might've been Paul Sellers. And I was like, wow, that's a cool looking tool. It takes off so much material. And then I watched a video from someone else and they had a saw rasp and then someone else and someone else. And it was in my mind that all of a sudden I had to go and get a saw rasp. So I did, and it is such a cool tool. You really should go out and buy yourself one as well. It's so much fun to use. Um, I think what it is, is basically bandsaw blades. 
Um, one side's fine, one side's a little bit rougher. To be honest, I can't really tell the difference in practice, but when you start using it and start working away, it takes off so much material so quickly. Very, very useful tool. This is one that's a lot of fun to have in the, in the workshop. Um, yeah, you can do some really cool stuff with it for such a simple tool. The bottom half down here is a little bit of a hodgepodge mix of different chisels, and that's because I've got a mix of different chisels down here. These ones here, you can see, well, you can sort of see that it's got my logo engraved in it. These are the Aldi chisels that Paul Sellers talked up eight or nine years ago. I bought these for about 12 bucks. Um, there's four of them. I've been using them ever since. These are my go-to chisels that I use all the time. They're fantastic. My sharpening has gone a lot better over the years. I remember when I first started with these, you know, I could have dragged it across concrete and it probably would have gone sharper than it was. Um, but now I've got, you know, uh, I learned how to sharpen is what it comes down to. If you're gonna use chisels, make sure you're using sharp chisels. I don't go stupid overboard, but I get them to where they're very sharp and they do exactly what I want them to do. Blunt chisels slip, sharp chisels don't. So it's safer to be sharp. Um, there are heaps of great sharpening videos out there. I personally love Matt Esley's ones. Um, he released one, I'm going to say it's just over a year ago now, probably goes for half hour and it covers every step, common sense the whole way, and it's just, it's just a fantastic video. In fact, I'm going to link to it down below because it's such a good video for sharpening. I watch it every now and again just to make sure I'm remembering all the steps I'm supposed to be doing. These black chisels, um, I bought them as a set when we did the pink project last year. So Mark Dana, um, Ashley Walker, they set up a an auction. We We gave away tools that we made ourselves and then there were all different makers that donated gifts and, um, and projects that they had built and they raised, well we raised, I'm going to say over $17,000 which is pretty crazy. That was really cool. So one of the tools that I made was a, I think it was a rabbiting plane using a chisel um, and I had to buy a chisel because I didn't want to give away any of my own chisels for it. I was in a bit of a time, pressure, uh, time pinch so I went to Bunnings and I bought this pack of Stanley chisels. I sharpened up the one that I gave really nice and everything worked fine. However, these aren't my favorite chisels. I just don't really like the black plastic. Um, if I'm gonna scrape up some glue, this is the chisel that I'm generally using. I do have a Trojan chisel down the end here. The reason I've got this one is because it's only six mil wide, whereas the uh, skinniest, skinniest? Least widthiest chisel <laughs> for the uh, Aldi ones is about eight mil. So I just needed something smaller. Um, which is why it's, it's it's kind of all over the place. I don't like the look of it, but they all work is the main thing. And then at this end, I've got three chisels, which I'm quite excited about. I haven't used them in anger yet. I've used them just for test cuts and things like that. Um, but these are mortising chisels. Uh, I bought these from Bunning, uh, from Bunnings. I bought these from Timbercon um, a month or two ago. I've sharpened them up. I've used them for test cuts, like I said, but I haven't actually used them on a project. So. I'm looking forward to doing a little furniture project soon where I can actually go and pull these out and use them. One thing I've learned over the last, I'm going to say the last two years is where it really finally got drummed into me. If you have a sharp chisel, all your work is a lot easier, goes a lot faster and it's a lot more enjoyable. So I went and watched a whole bunch of sharpening videos and I taught myself a few different ways. Eventually I settled on Matt Esley's guide to sharpening. Um, I'll link that video down below because it's such a, such a good video. Matt Esley's Friggin' awesome. If you haven't subscribed to him, go and do it. He's, he's criminally, criminally, criminally undersubscribed on YouTube for the content and the quality of the content he puts out. But he's got a sharpening video which takes you through everything you need to know. It's common sense the whole way. Um, there, there's nothing pretentious or over the top about it. It's just this is how you sharpen your chisels. And it works perfectly for me. So definitely check it out. And that is that wing. Let's move into the center. This is an exciting part of the tool cabinet, the main body. I really like this part as well. I like all of it. This isn't a very fun video, is it? I'm just saying that I like stuff over and over. Anyway, in here I've got, as you can see, hand planes and different types of planes. And then pretty much general crap that just gets put on this shelf. And every now and again, I clean it up if I'm gonna do a video. So what do we have here? Melbourne Tool Company. Last year when I was making a set of chairs, I bought both of these, I bought both of their spoke shaves. One's got a curved base, one has got a flat base. These are great fun to use. I don't use them anywhere near enough. I need to use them more. I actually should look for a project uh, that focuses on these because they're so enjoyable to use.
It was a bit tricky finding a nice mounting position for them. So at the moment I've got some divots cut out of these dowels and that's where they sit in there. They, they stay in there, everything's nice and secure, but it would be nice to have a, a bit of a better method of locating them. Speaking of Melbourne Tool Company, I've got the hand plane as well. I bought this when they first came out. I went and bought it and oh, I love it. It weighs so much more than you would think. It performs really well. I've got a video on it um, and it's it, this gets used on pretty much all my projects now. There's as James would say, I chamfer all the things. That's pretty much how it works. But not only chamfer all the things, I also round over all the things with this because it's fantastic for that. I'm not sure why, but there's also something really special about this blade. When I clean up a box and I go around all four, uh, all four sides from the top, I can get a curl running almost the whole way around if I use this one. If I use one of the other hand planes, I can't get it actually as nice or as smooth, which is a little bit strange because they're probably sharper than this one. Um, but yeah. Really, really fun tool, looks beautiful. And it stays there with some magnets. You can see there's two magnets in there and then a sort of an L-shaped ledge, which means I can just throw it up and I don't have to worry about it. I was scared it was gonna fall out when I built that, but it's never been a problem. It's awesome. It's a cool plane, Melbourne Tool Company, get on them. Alrighty. Also from Timbercon, I've got a set of the engineer squares. <laughs> Now looking at it, there's so many glue marks on it that I wonder if they're actually still as square as they're supposed to be. I might test these later on, um, but all three of them are wonderful to have in the shop. Very, very useful. And the small one, this little eye gauging baby square, oh, it's so cute. It looks a little bit, it looks like a toy, I'll be honest. It looks like a little toy. This is probably out of the three of them, the most useful one because it just gets into every little space, especially if you're making small boxes. This is, it's. It's cute, <laughs> but no, it does work really, really well. Um, I don't remember where I got this from, but this is just a engineering square, but a 45 one also comes in very handy as well. I've got two router planes. These are super cool. I did a video for this one. The brand is Cowry Man. Um, they actually reached out to me and said, hey, you know, we've got this hand plane, there's a new design, would you like to test it out? Or sort of, we've got this router plane. Um, look, if someone's going to offer me something for free, I'm not in a position to say no. <laughs> so I said yes straight away. Um, looking at it online, I thought, gee, it looks very different to every router plane that I've ever seen. This is spectacular. I can't talk it up highly enough. It is incredibly comfortable to use. It is incredibly easy to use. It's, it's, it's so easy to use. It's ridiculous um, and the lock nut on the back it looks a little bit silly but it just makes it so simple to loot, to use you unlock you tighten you lock it's so much better than the little fiddly ones where you've got to you know turn the little nailed, nailed knob at the back um, I can't talk this up highly enough so for Kauri Man after I did that review video um, I sent it over to them and he said he loved it, which was fantastic because I said that I love the tool um, and I said I'm actually going to go out and buy one. So I went and had this in my shopping cart and then as I was in the process of buying it, he actually sent me an email and said, hey, um, to say thanks for the first one, we're going to send you another one. Which one would you like? So I'm like, whoa, I'll take this one. Thank you very much. I didn't do a review on it because well, I didn't want to have two reviews in a row of router planes on the channel. I thought that might be a little bit sus, um, but it's it's great fun. This one is basically the same thing. It's just a lot bigger, it takes the same blades. So I've got three different blades, I think, for this one. So I can chuck them in here as well. Um, but this one also has a fence on it. So you've got two screws that you loosen, um, and then you can lock this fence in so that you can have a consistent, uh, consistent straight line when you're making your grooves, which is really cool. Um, out of the two, that one's my favorite just because it's a bit smaller and a bit easier to use. This one's really cool though as well. Um, they're, they're both awesome. I know they don't look like traditional woodworking tools, like traditional routed planes, what they actually look like, but they work so well, you can't actually complain about it. So yes, Cowrie Man, if you're thinking of them, these ones are definite pluses, go for them. When I was a little kid, thinking of what a woodworker was, I thought a woodworker is someone who has a plane who knows how to use it. Um, and I still think that. <laughs> this is woodworking for me. An actual, you know, seeing a hand plane, that's, that's what I think of when I see woodworking. And they're so much fun to use. You're crazy if you haven't tried it. This one, uh, look, I'll be honest, I'm no expert in this. It's a number five, there you go. I would have said seven because it seems so big. 
seven must be all the way up here. Um, I bought this specifically to flatten my workbench, which I did a couple of years ago. Uh, originally when I built the workbench, I flattened it using the router sled method, which worked out fine. And then I sanded it, everything was good. After eight years or whatever it was of gouging up the, the workbench, I decided I had to flatten it again and I wanted to do it by hand. So I bought this, I tuned it all up, um, and then I used this to flatten the workbench. I think I spent three hours out here. I was completely cast by the end of it, but the workbench is flatter than it's ever been. So much fun to use. It's a bit of a shame that I don't really have more usage for this hand plane, because it was really, really good fun to use. So it sits there. I really like this piece of spotted gum. This this spotted gum was part of the ones that I got when I got the tool cabinet. Um, it's got a really cool sap line through it, which, although it's very dusty now, when it's oiled up, it sort of looks like that Lichtenberg, the lightning through wood. Um, something that I'm never going to do. I've got no interest in it, but I do like the look every now and again. I quite like that. And down here, I've got my hand plane. So I've got two four and a halves and then three number fours. Again, I was like, well, what hand plane do I buy? So Paul Sellers is the person that you <laughs> that you watch if you want to learn about that. Um, the number fours are great fun. I bought these, when did I get these from? This one here, ah, this one here I've actually not used and it's broken. You can see here that the, the handle's cracked in the center. I bought this for $10, uh, I'm gonna say 11 years ago from Trash and Treasure. Um, if you go past Trash and Treasure now to buy a hand plane and you find one like this in the same terrible condition, you'd probably pay 150 bucks for it. For some reason, they've just suddenly skyrocketed. So I bought this, it was completely destroyed, completely chewed up. I fixed up most of it. Um, I think I did make a new handle and then I ended up putting the handle on this one because this thread at the back here, it's, it's fused to the body. I need to heat it up with a blowtorch and bang it a few times and then get it out. I've never actually gone to the effort. So I will do that eventually. Yes, that's not the handle that came with this one. I think I took this one off and put it on here. No. So yeah, this handle here actually came from the red telco one. And then after I cleaned it all up, I managed to pick up this, this hand plane. So I put the handle on here. So the broken handle came from here and is now on there. Long story short, this is a nice big, heavy, chunky plane. I use it a lot. It's a lot of fun to use. Um, and the good thing is because I've got two of them, I've got two blades, I can just swap them in and out. So as soon as this one gets a little bit blunt, I just switch over to that one. I drop it in here and then I sharpen them all at the same time. For the number four planes, these are also great fun to use. I think if you watch Paul Sellers, he'll say that the number four plane is the only plane you really need. Um, I've got three of them because I had, uh, what did I have? I had a, an eBay voucher a few years ago for like 150 bucks. So I don't often use eBay because the auctions kind of piss me off where you, you go and bid on everything and at the last second you get beaten on everything. So I went and bid on three separate hand planes and I won all three separate hand planes. I think in the months beforehand, I probably missed out on about 10 different hand planes uh, through eBay. So I was kind of annoyed <laughs> that I managed to win all three of them. So within a week, all three of these came from different sellers um, in different states of repair. And then, look, look, there's no regrets now. It cost me a bit of money at the time, but no regrets now. I had a lot of fun cleaning up all three of them and now I get to use them all the time. Um, if you're not using a hand plane, you're not woodworking properly. <laughs> no, that's not fair. If you're not using a hand plane, you're not getting a lot of the enjoyment out of woodworking. They're just fun to use. Have you noticed that I think woodworking's fun? It's pretty much why I do it. I'm not a very precious or sentimental person. So on here, I've just scribbled in black marker 30 degrees. So this blade is cut at 30 degrees. This is at 30 degrees. And then this one's at 40 degrees, a little bit steeper. Basically, if I'm using one of these ones and I'm finding it a little bit tough going, I'll pull out this one. I take off a lot less, but it seems to cut through a lot more, uh, a lot more figure and stuff like that. So the planes are great fun. I've got a bevel guide here. This was made by Vippen. I think it's Vippen Envisage Designs. Uh, Vippen's actually one of the guys who did the pink project with us as well, which is really cool. Um, great guy. Met him at the Made of Makeup. I've met him at a few 
maker meetups now. Um, and I think in return, I don't think I bought this off him. I think I gave him a center punch or an all. That's what it was. I made an all on the lathe for him. So we did a bit of a trade. So that was really cool. This used to hang up over here with the chisels, but once, once I got the mortise chisels, I sort of ran out of room for it. So sorry, Vipin, I'm gonna find room for it soon. Here, I have some cabinet scrapers. I bought these from Timbercon a little while ago. I haven't had the chance to use them on anything yet. I really need to, to get stuck into these. Um, this is a little bit of an obscure one, but this is just a block of beeswax. I bought this for a particular reason many years ago. I think I made my own polish for outdoor furniture and I used a chunk of it. I've got heaps left over. What I use it for is my hand planes. So whenever I'm about to start using it, I just go and rub that on and that keeps it nice and uh, slippery. Works out really well. So that's why that sits right here. So it's always within arm's reach. Down the bottom, I've got these beautiful drawers. Um, it's oak and jarra double dovetails. I made it on the Incra jig. If you haven't seen that, go and check out Timbercon's channel because I put a really cool video up there showing how to make them. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's just, just straight out, it is beautiful. I think I've got more up here. Yeah, here's a, a demo one of it. It is just absolutely gorgeous. It is my favorite joint. I could never do it by hand, but on the machine, it's... Uh, it's beautiful. I'm going to do some more projects using this joint very soon. Uh, I actually only made these drawers a little while ago. Um, I'm going to say maybe two or three months ago. Before then, I had these ones, which were box joint drawers. I made the box joints on my jig, Woodfather's jig. Have you heard of it? Link it down below. Um, but I was never really happy with them. And the reason why is because I use plywood down the bottom for the base. I thought that that would look really cool in here, but it looked, it looked like plywood stuck on the bottom of a nice box frankly. Um, so, so yes, when I was doing the tutorial for double dovetails, I thought, gee, it'd be nice to redo these boxes and I'm much, much happier with it. And only in the making of this video did I realize that this is American oak, which matches the American oak plywood on the front of the box, on the front of the cabinet as well. As for what's inside the drawers, I actually don't even know. Let's find out. So drawer number one has got, oh, here we go. This is parts for the router plane, um, two different size blades and a couple of spare parts for it. Drawer number two, ah, oh, yep. So in here, we've got one of the very first awls I think I made, um, not the greatest one. And I used a nail for the nib, which probably could be improved. And then it's also got a bunch of stickers. Um, those stickers are all duplicates of ones that I've already got up on the sticker wall. So don't go mad if you saw your name or your logo in there because I'm just looking for somewhere else to put it up. Drawer number three has got my little chamfer plane. One side does a chamfer, the other side does a round over. Neither side does a very good job. I bought this because it was reviewed kind of okay, um, but it's never been all that good for me. I only use it on projects where I don't really care if it comes out perfectly well or not. There's also, a little corner chisel, just a, a cheapo one. This cost me about 10 bucks at Timbercon. Um, I was told that it was okay, not that good. I absolutely love it. I use this all the time, pretty much every time I make a box and I have a round over down the bottom and then I wanna make it a nice crisp, sharp edge. You just go and chuck it in, whack that down with a hammer and you've got a perfect 90 degrees. So I quite like that. And the last drawer, it's got two little dowel centers so that I don't lose them. And then a bunch of my logo. I bought these a few years ago um, and I've made quite a few pieces of furniture and some tools that have had my logo uh, inserted into it. But now that I've got my own laser engraver, I don't tend to use them all that much. So that's all the tools in the tool cabinet. And you might've noticed that there's a real lack of measuring and layout tools. That's because all of those are thrown down on a bench at the back of the workshop because I use them all the time and I haven't put the effort into figuring out how to lay them out inside here. I think what I'm actually gonna do is make a separate small little cabinet without a front. Um, and I'll use that for all my measuring tools, all the, the layouts, the, the uh, rulers and gauges and guides, and probably the engineering squares and things like that as well, because they're the ones that I just go and grab all the time. Um, and it might be nice to have them all together instead of in here as well, taking up all the space because there is a limited amount of space. So ladies and gentlemen, that is my tool cabinet. Thanks for watching. Um, it was fun for me to go through memory lane and think about where I got these tools from, how long I've had them. The idea for me is to become a quality hobbyist.
if that makes sense. Um, I want to be able to make nice furniture whenever I want at home. I don't want to do it professionally. I don't want to sell stuff all over the world. I just want to be able to say, hey, you need a cabinet? I'll make you a cabinet. Don't worry. It's all good. Um, and I'm on my way there, I think. So yeah, these are the tools that are helping me get there. Cool. All right. I'm going to stop rambling. Um, thanks so much for watching. Have a Merry Christmas. It's almost Christmas time. <laughs> Hopefully you enjoyed the video a little bit as well. If you didn't, don't tell me. If you did, leave a comment down below. <laughs> All the best. Cheers, gang.